we've been looking at Matthew 18, um, specifically verses 15 through 20. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just go verse by verse through this uh, section and really just break it down and make it easier to understand and uh, to, uh, to manage. So Matthew 18, 15 says this, If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. So first off, let's just kind of get a couple things out of the way. First off, talking about he's talking about with sin here. He's not talking about with conflict or general tension or not getting along with someone. I, I'm reminded of um, with my mom's passing, there's been obviously some fa family drama there. And um, one thing was somewhat, uh, I guess you could say, amusing being on the outside uh, there were these two people who were kind of, um, uh, I don't know how to put it. They had uh, uh, conflicts, tension. Uh, they weren't <laughs> weren't seeing eye to eye, whatever you want to say. And there was a, another family member who felt the need to stick to take a side and then to stick their fingers into it. And uh, obviously, that did not was not a smart thing to do, and it didn't go well. So we're not talking about this. This Matthew eighteen section is not talking about um, you know, hey, you're not getting along with somebody, or there's just general life tension, or you know, you're in conflict with somebody. It's talking about specifically with sin, because we like what we like to do is we like like to make mountain mountains out of molehills, and then we like to kind of um, you know get our way on everything. It's just, it's not going to work like that. Uh, so it's talking specifically about sin. Uh, the next thing I want to point out is it's a lot easier um, to talk to people like this um, if you are their friend, or at least if you're friendly with them. Sometimes uh, we go and we, uh, oh, well, I don't like what this person's doing, and even though I don't know them at all, I'm going to go in there and tell them all the things that they need to change. Um, I'm reminded uh, there was a teen girl that went to this, uh, this church, and um, not... At the current church, I mean, went to a church, and uh, she was kind of more tomboyish. Didn't really like to do, you know, the whole girly thing and all that, which was fine. Uh, and so she one time decided to dress up and, you know, get in a dress and kind of go the extra mile to to present herself well. I don't know why she decided to do this, but she decided that this was um, the uh, this was just what she wanted to do. So she did it, and there was this person who went to the church, and they never took the time to talk to her, never took the time to, you know, check in on her or anything like that. And uh, what happened <laughs> was as soon as she walks in, they, they they practically met her at the door, and, oh, oh, you're not doing this right, the dress is supposed to be like this, you're supposed to wear a, uh, this with that or something like that. And, and so they keep, like, at the door, they never took the time to, to even talk to her, but yet, you know, when she went out of her way to try and present herself well, they had something to say with that. And there's a lot of little nitpicking and, and, and stuff that goes on, in, in, specifically in churches, where people feel like it's their need to, you know, tell other people how to do their job better or to complain about what they're doing and all this stuff. And it's like, no, 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 that's not, not the job of the church. Um, so it's, it's a lot easier to address a friend's sin than it is to just nitpick somebody um and also you know you need to say it in the right way and you need to have the right expression i mean you don't say things in a rude way and then also remember you don't just communicate with people by the words that you're saying you also do with the tone of your voice and the expression on your face so if you really want to communicate well to somebody make sure that you aren't snarling at them while you're trying to tell them how much you love them um, if you aren't trying to restore somebody in the church they know if you can't stand somebody in the church, guess what? They know. Um, another thing here is we're not talking in front of others. Like, look at this. It says, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. It's very obvious this is a one-on-one -on -one kind of situation. Um, I'm reminded of a, of a pastor that I knew who thought it was a good idea to reprimand a board member right in the middle of a board meeting. Um, he, he planned it out in advance, and he thought this was a great idea. And he was, excuse me, he, he was just very unprofessional and classless. You know, he, he, here he is in the board meeting reprimanding one of the board members. It would have been a better conversation one-on-one -on -one than it was for an entire board meeting. Um, then I'm also reminded of a guy who had been on a board. Uh, this is a problem guy. He went around from church to church starting problems. But unfortunately, he had actually been on a board at some unfortunate church. I'm not sure where. I think in Colorado. And... Uh, 
he, so he was a board member, and so he decided in the middle of a board meeting to call the pastor out, and uh, really did not go well, and it caused the pastor to have even more problems. I mean, hey, if you think somebody, something's going wrong, really follow Matthew 18, and first go one-on-one, -on -one, and just the two of you. Um, so typically what we do, though, is we don't like someone, so we push them out, even if they didn't do something sinful. We just push them out because I don't like this person. And then rather than correcting them, because so we don't correct them, we just say, hey, good riddance, and wash our hands of them. And in that way, we only keep those people who are just like us. So, okay, I don't like this person, so I'm just going to kind of cold shoulder them, push them out. I'm not going to correct them because they didn't do anything sinful, but I don't like them. So, hey, good riddance. Um, and uh, if they did sin, sometimes we rush to condemn them so we can get rid of them instead of working with them like Jesus did with Judas. The Bible says that Jesus loved till the end. And so this is something where it's like, well, um, you know, if we're trying to be like Christ, then we might want to start with how we treat people. We don't want to just keep people who are like us, because if we are only keeping people who are like us, then the church doesn't grow. <laughs> we attract our little group of four and no more, and that's it. When you're a smaller church, you think like a smaller church. You micromanage every single issue. Larger churches, they have to learn how to let small issues go and to delegate. If one person is doing everything, they will not be able to grow. There will be a, 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 a maximum ceiling that they can hit. And nothing more than that will ever get done. But if instead of that, um, you, you first off delegate things where you're using, utilizing other people's skills, but then second off, you... Um, you, you, you don't make a big deal out of every little issue, the church is free to grow more because it's not being micromanaged and suppressed. Um, or sometimes we avoid conflict to try and make the church more comfortable, not dealing with what we should and what we tolerate, we allow, we encourage it. If you're tolerating something that is encouraging it to grow, think of it like a bacteria. If you, if you do not clean, then you are allowing that, that bacteria to grow. It's one of those things where you're, if you're tolerating it, you are encouraging it. Um, and so there are some times when you have to address an issue and sometimes when you don't. Uh, my personal rule of thumb is if I'm too cowardly to have an honest conversation with someone to their face, I don't get to talk behind their back or with my cronies and ambush them. That's my typical rule of thumb. So just a few highlights here. This is talking about with sin. It's easier if you're a friend and not in front of others. Save them face. Don't try to embarrass people. Matthew 18, 16. But if we, he won't listen... Take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. So that brings us to this next verse. Typically what we do is we get in a yelling argument with somebody and then go on a pout or stew or tell other people about it, rather than talk, excuse me, talk one-on-one -on -one with somebody and work it out, or if it is a sin, addressing it. But usually it's not a sin. Usually it's us getting irritated. And uh, it's usually usually best to not do this in a, in a text. Texts are misunderstood. They're impersonal. I, I heard it once said that whatever, you, whatever form of communication that you think, go the next step up. So if you think it's a text message, do a call instead. If you think it's a phone call, do an in-person instead. And so I, I, I kind of follow a system like this. Fire in person. Restore somebody oftentimes through call so that they don't feel like you're all up in their business kind of gives them a little bit of space If you're done with a problem person you might text or email just for the sake of having a paper trail of some sort uh, But that's something you really have to be careful about because once again, it's very impersonal and there's a lot of arguments that, that surface because of lack of clarity um, Another thing is so and, and then if I'm just doing a real quick. Hey, don't do this uh, It's just gonna be a text if it's not a big deal, but it's something that I, I need to mention I just send a text sometimes so uh, <clears throat> It's important that we follow the actual what is being said here in Matthew 18 because what we do is, is, is we don't. We don't get along with somebody and then we yell at them and then we, it's like person against person so we just sit and stew about it. So it says here, if you won't listen, take one or two others with you. This is the whole two or three witnesses, okay? Um, so now other people are, are free to put their input in. If, if I'm going and correcting somebody, I take somebody else with me, I'm going to know if I'm doing it with the right attitude, if I'm doing it with... Um, uh, if, if, if I'm actually right in correcting them, they'll be able to say, hey, uh, Michael, I don't think that you're right on this one. Um, and so, so don't find other people who also don't like the person that you're, you're, you're addressing, okay? 
Because what happens is we get them, and we know that they don't like them, we get them to join us in correcting the person in the most degrading way possible, and it just kind of makes enemies. So never a good idea. Find two or three objective people, okay, and then and then talk with talk with the person and really try to restore. So some highlights: uh, don't send it, and don't try to reprimand through text. Don't find others who who don't like them as well, and don't degrade them. Matthew eighteen seventeen: if he doesn't pay attention to them. Uh, the two or three witnesses, you and the two or three witnesses, tell the church if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. So now we kind of see things escalating. Uh, it, it goes from a personal problem to a corporate problem, it escalates to pastor and the church leadership. Uh, and, and so it, it's a church problem at this point. The, 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 the board is aware of it, the pastor is aware of it, this is, this is kind of things that have been escalated. So you, um, <coughs> if you notice, um, I'm going to turn back to verse 15 right quick. It says, if your brother sins against you, that's singular, if sin, sins against you. And then we get to 18, 17, it says, if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile tax collector to you, again, in the singular. Um, and so the idea here is that it started as a personal conflict, okay, and it escalated to a church problem, and you have to submit yourself to the church and abide by the judgment of the church. So, Sometimes people go to the pastor for every single conflict, and that's definitely not what it says. You need to go one-on-one -on -one with somebody. You'd, you'd be surprised how many times people come to the pastor and say, oh, you need to fix this, and you know, I don't like this person, or this person's doing this, and it's like, okay, well, hold on. Why don't you go talk to them? Because it's not the pastor's job to go and talk to them. It's, it's your job to go and talk to them. So just some quick highlights here. Um, abide by the judgment of the church. <laughs> don't go to the pastor for, their con for, uh, for your conflict. Um, it's only when things get escalated to the church, it's the situation of like uh, excommunication. So you should be trying to work it out. There's actually a verse in Philippians where two women are not getting along, and it didn't end with one of them getting kicked out. Uh, Paul just says, hey, get along with each other. Uh, so then that takes us to Matthew 18. It says, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. So this is one of those verses that is very tricky in translation. Um, maybe some translations will say, whatever you bind, um, I don't know how, how it would maybe be said. Um, whatever you bind will be bound. Um, yeah, will be bound. That's how it's worded. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And... It's just very unhelpful because some translations are, are so much different. But if you look here, I believe this is the CSB, it says, will have already, uh, will have been bound in heaven. Maybe a more precise uh, way would, would be to say, it would have already been bound. So the idea here is that you don't get to just declare whatever you want. That's definitely not what it's talking about. It's talking about that we declare God's will and then it, 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 that's how it is. So whatever you bind, whatever you, you're declaring God's will here, and as you are declaring God's will on earth, it, it, it's the same in heaven, okay? So maybe another way of saying that, and I'll say that clearer. Let me just hold on a second. Um, but the idea here that I want you to get is that God is not obligated to fulfill whatever we invent. Oh, I invent this, so I'm just going to attach this into a prayer. Like we do the whole, we do the same thing with the whole, in, in the name of Jesus, Oh well, I've stamped my seal on it. Therefore, whatever I prayed is 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 God's will. And we do the same thing with this verse too. Oh, I'm binding this. I'm binding that. What does that even mean? And most of the time, people don't understand what it means. So uh, this is addressing the sin. Uh, th th this tells us that this shows us actually that addressing sin is God's will. It is God's will not to brush sin under the rug. Now, there's some situations where where the sin is not directly addressed, uh, like First uh, John says, the sin that does not lead to death. Um, and sometimes, like let's say somebody's grieving and they say something arrogant or stupid or something like that, it wouldn't really be the time or the place to address that. So, uh, but we're talking about a mature Christian who is who knows better and they are living in sin that they know is a sin. And this will kind of help us to, to figure that out. As we talk to them, we'll be able to see if they're really set in their ways or if they're struggling or whatnot. So um, it's definitely not necessarily something where every time that somebody sins, do you need to correct it at this time, at this place, for every sin? It, it, it doesn't need to be like that. Um, and so as a church binds and looses, we are acting in God's place. We are binding and loosing the person. So you might say, well, what does that mean, binding and loosing? Well, hold on, let's, let's kind of look at some highlights here. First off, don't get to declare whatever. When we're praying, we do not just get to declare something. 
church leadership acts in God's place as God told us to in this in this passage. And that takes us to the to the rough idea in bind and loose. Uh, bind basically means to declare something unlawful or prohibited, and loose more or less means to release or break or destroy. So we see some examples of this, for instance, in Matthew 5, 19, it says, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same, whoever breaks, that's the same word. Um, and we're in Matthew 21, 2. At once you will tie, you will find a donkey tied there. Same word again. So uh, here you could, you could possibly just um, get around the issue by translating like this instead. Truly I tell you, whoever you condemn on earth will have already been condemned in heaven, and whoever you acquit on earth will have already been acquitted in heaven. So in that way, you could say that binding and loosing is more or less synonymous with condemning and acquitting. Um, think of more of uh, in the court. Because remember, the church back then was a Jew, it was the Jewish synagogue, and the Jews had their whole life there. So to treat somebody as a tax collector or a Gentile, that would be to exclude them from the from the from the synagogue, and um, with this whole binding and acquitting, you're talking about the teachers of the law, how and how they would declare a scripture legally binding in a situation or not. And so, the, very much so, we're talking about condemning or acqui acquitting a person, and you know, basically taking it from there. Um, so, uh, real quick, there just to kind of show you, binding is basically a condemning, loosing is basically acquitting. Um, if it was modern day. So that takes us to the last two verses of the section. And it says, Again, truly I tell you, if you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I'll read that through one more time. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among, among them. So typically how people, what people do is they ignore the entire argument, the entire context of what we just read with bringing correction in the church. And instead they just read these last three verses separate from the entire context. So, hey, um, if two or three of us gather and pray, then all of our wildest dreams will come true. And that it's not even talking about prayer, it's talking about correcting somebody, okay? So I've already kind of broken down verse 18 and how it's not saying you can just bind and loose whatever. But let's let's address some things here in verses 19 through 20. First thing I want to address, it says, um, <clears throat> Truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. He's not talking about anything whatsoever. He's not, he's not saying if you pray about anything He's saying when there's these judgment issues and you pray about any of that. So let's kind of break this down. He's not talking about prayer in general. And he's not saying that every single time that you pray, you have, there has to be two or three of you gathered together. Okay, If two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, okay, so, so there's this church conflict and you are praying about it. That doesn't mean that every single thing that you pray about, but rather everything about the church conflict that you pray about. It will be done for you by my Father in heaven. And the idea here is that God is working with you and alongside you. You're not alone in this as, as you deal with it. Um, th there's, a few th there's a few reasons that we know that, that this is not simply talking about prayer generally. First off, Scripture never requires two people in prayer for anything. Saying it off, the context is not prayer but judgment. We're not talking about two or, two or three are gathered in prayer that then, hey, I'm there with them in, in, in this. That, that's definitely not, not what it's talking about at all. And so what we've done is we ignore the whole correcting section and we just say, hey, um, and, and we see, hear it a lot in church. Hey, two or three of us are going to pray about this. And uh, yeah, then God will be with it and be there with us. But <laughs> that, that would actually be a contradiction of Scripture because God never once says that there has to be two or three people gathered in prayer for him to be there. He actually, what he says is that he'll be with us to the end of the age. And also he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. He doesn't say whoever calls on the name of the Lord as long as there's two or three. And what about martyrs and whatnot who are in prison? Like, you're saying God is not going to listen and, and, and answer them because there's maybe one person locked up in solitary hold or something? That just doesn't, that doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. So um, well, this is not talking about prayer. Uh, as sin is addressed, God is with us, so long as we do it right. That's the basic idea of these two verses here. Uh, so just real quick, pastors are not there to keep peace. 
They are there to watch for the false, to protect the flock, to correct, to teach. Those are the jobs of the, of the pastor, not to not to keep the peace. Um, there's uh, a lot of times where, where peace is not possible necessarily. I shouldn't say that. Uh, where, where peace is, is not really the aim, but rather growth is um, when things have to be addressed, for instance. So um, when I was teaching, the well, let, before I say that, there's a couple highlights here. Um, if you pray about any judgment issue, not just anything in general. When sin is addressed, God is with us. Um, absolutely. P pastors aren't to keep the peace. Okay, so um, last week I was teaching this um, this lesson, and somebody made the suggestion that um, the, it's you and the Holy Spirit, you and another person. And I, I researched it, and I don't really think that that is what it's talking about at all. Um, I'm not going to say it's impossible this, that, that the Holy Spirit is one of the two, um, two witnesses, but it seems very probable not. Um, the first reason I don't think so is because he says, again, I tell you. Now, what that again does is it connects it to the previous statement. It's like whenever there's a therefore, look to see what the therefore is there for, because he's, sum he's, he's summarizing a point. So the fact that he says, again, I tell you, that means it's connected to the previous argument, the previous statement. And the previous statement was talking about correction. So um, next, he says, if two of you, if two of you. Um, third off, it references uh, the Old Testament law and assumes that you know the law that it's talking about where two witnesses are required. Look at Deuteronomy 19.15. It says, one witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Um, the, the next reason why I don't think it's talking about the Holy Spirit as one of the two is because it never mentions the Holy Spirit in this whole section. Um, and then ne uh, the, the fifth reason, um, the pa in the middle of a, th this is the middle of a passage talking about excommunicated persons. And the whole Holy Spirit doesn't really fit with what we're talking about. And then that takes us to the last one. The Holy Spirit wouldn't fit the argument because God said he would be there if two or three were gathered. But if the Holy Spirit was there, he'd, then God would be there. Like that, that, that doesn't really fit. It doesn't make sense. Um, and, and then the whole issue, well, well, this was before the Holy Spirit was given, maybe. Well, yes, Jesus did say this before the Holy Spirit was given. However, that doesn't change what this passage teaches on. The The giving of the Holy Spirit doesn't doesn't affect at all how this scripture is applied to us. Um, we can't correct somebody with just me and the Holy Spirit. That's a terrible idea because I might be wrong, because I might be self-righteous. I might mistake something for the Holy Spirit. I can be misled. And so having two or three witnesses is a check against that. Um, and another thing, yes, the Holy Spirit hadn't been given yet, but Matthew had been written after the Holy Spirit had been given. So it doesn't really fit to, to try and weasel in the Holy Spirit in this section when the conclusion is pretty clear that we should be taking care of issues and that God is with, and God is with us as we take care of issues, but that we do definitely need to have the right systems and checks in place.